did draw blood. We could keep 30 goats. No, not the hair. Draw blood. <laughs> For some reason, he's not super interested in his morning bottle this morning. I don't know why that is. But I wanted to introduce you guys to our newest addition. We picked him up yesterday. He's shivering. Are you cold? No, oh, he's warm inside his mouth. Yeah, it's only it's only 30 degrees here, and he's used to being in a barn. But this little dude, his name is Farrell. He is a mini La Mancha. He's an F2 mini La Mancha. So when it comes to creating a mini La Mancha, it takes six generations to technically declare them purebred. You cross between a standard La Mancha and you know your standard or purebred Nigerian dwarf, and you try to stay as close to 50-50 as you move up in the generations until you get an F6 generation. And the F6 generation is considered purebred at that point. Before that, they're just considered experimental. So he is an F2, so he's a couple steps up in the line. So he's not hypothermic. He's got a nice warm palate on the inside of his mouth, but he is shivering a little bit. And I don't know if that's just because he's a little bit scared being in a new place, but I think I'll turn the heat lamp on for these guys, huh? He's used to snuggling with more than one baby at night, and all I've got to give him is Titus as far as an age appropriate companion. So you want us to turn on the heat lamp? Hmm. You want your bottle? When he was sent home with me, he was sent with a whole bunch of milk from his farm. And this is actually milk from my girls. I don't know if he can tell the difference. I have seen goats refuse bottles when there's any amount of milk replacer in it, but this is pure raw goat's milk that we heated up for him. And he's not interested this morning, but otherwise he's acting really, really normal. Titus. Titus here was not a bottle baby. Titus was damn raised, but you would never know it. He wants this bottle with everything in him. You can't have it. It's not yours. It's not yours. No, don't bite my face. You already drew blood once this morning. You too, look. You're just copying him. <laughs> Do you want this yet? Oh my goodness, he's just holding it in his mouth. You don't like Nigerian milk, do you? I'll try again in a little bit with his milk from your farm. But this is what I have for you, dude. Farrell is actually two weeks old today and we got him from a local farm called Buck Creek Stables. And they breed La Manchas and Mini La Manchas and Nigerians over there and also Mini Sanans and probably standard size sonnets. I'm not exactly sure what all they do on their farm, but I do know that they have some awesome looking little mini La Manchas. And I brought, I brought Farrell onto our farm so that he can help contribute to the mini La Mancha herd that we have underway. I have three of our standard size La Manchas bred back to our Nigerian dwarf buck, Havoc, and I plan to retain every single doe that those girls have. And in preparation for keeping lots of does back this year, I actually have gotten rid of, it feels like quite a few, but it's only been four um, does from my herd, but it does help make space in the barn, which makes me feel really good because we're not only keeping back a lot of does, for you know, our dairy herd purposes, but we're keeping back quite a lot of bucks that we're gonna turn into weathers for our meat, for meat goats, for local families, as well as ourselves. I love you, Tidy, you're a good boy. <laughs> the 
So in downsizing our herd, we now only have 12 does in the barn, which seems really crazy. There's only 12 goats in the barn, if you don't include our boys over here in the kidding stall. And I did a little bit of math. Technically, a standard sized doe only needs about 16 square feet of shed space to get out of the weather. And this main area here in our barn is approximately 24 feet long and 20 feet wide and adds up to 480 square feet, which technically means we could keep 30 goats in this space. Now that is allowing for a completely open barn situation where they can run as much as they want to out in the field. If I had them close up in a barn full time, they'd need at least twice that much space. I never, <laughs> never plan to have 30 goats in this barn. Possibly if we had a need to keep back a lot of goats as far as meat goats go, but I don't need that many dairy goats. That's for sure. So I felt really good about seeing that number. It means that I do have enough space for essentially as many goats as I want because I know I don't want probably more than, I don't really want any more than 25 that I have to manage as far as the dairy herd goes. I can keep a little bit more than that for the meat goats. They, they'll fluctuate in and out over the seasons, but right around 25 is really where I wanna keep it, and that includes the bucks. And that space math that I did for was just for this space here. It didn't include the space that I have open most of the time for our kidding stalls. Um, this adds, I don't remember how many more, I think it was 10 goats technically could fit in this space as well. So if you included the whole kidding, the kidding area plus this loafing area, we could fit 40, which would be a tight squeeze and I don't ever plan to do that. And as far as the pasture goes, we actually have more than enough space there as well. So we don't do any type of rotational grazing here. It's not that I'm against it, I just haven't been able to finagle how I would do that with a fixed barn like we have. I've thought about lane systems and all that, but as far as I'm concerned, it's not necessarily worth the brain power and all of that when I don't think I have to rotational graze. According to a couple different sources that I looked at, if you're going to keep goats on any given pasture long-term, and not rotationally graze them. You want to keep no more than five and a half head per acre. And we have right around six acres fenced in here. And so that also works out to around 30 animals. So I think that's perfect. I don't think we're ever really gonna be there. Possibly, like I said, with the meat goats um, included in that as well. But those guys can also move around in some of our other pastures. And so um, I'm really happy having learned that and it helps me really kind of set my goals and what I'm trying to do here. Hey, Boba. So I mentioned before how, whoa, you scared the girls. <laughs> so I mentioned before how Farrell is an F2 Mini La Mancha. He's an F2 Experimental Mini La Mancha. Um, what I am getting out of these girls, because I bred a standard size La Mancha to a purebred Nigerian dwarf, those will be F1s. And when I cross those F1 Mini La Mancha girls with my F2 Mini La Mancha buck, we're still only gonna get F2s out of that. So. When you cross the two different generations, the offspring of the two different generations is only one level above the lowest level of the parents. So Farrell in there, he's an F2. His daddy was an F1 or is an F1 mini La Mancha and his mom is an F3. So it didn't go one level above mom because dad didn't have um, as many generations behind him. So he is an F2 because his dad is an F1 and Elpis is trying to eat you. Hi, Abby. You're a good girl. You're trying to show the people your babies. Do you have babies right here? Do you have babies right here? I'll be back later. I don't know what your deal is. So it's still early yet. It's not milking time. I'm gonna wait another probably hour and a half. I'm gonna fill the bottle with the milk from his farm and see if he wants that in just a little bit. I'll be back. Yeah. Are you ready now? He is 
shaking his head at this. He does not want it. Listen, this is warmer. She said you might want it warmer. Come on. There we go. Gracious. Apparently he likes his milk piping hot. I didn't know that. <laughs> I texted the breeder and I said, hey, do you have any suggestions? She said, yeah, warm it up nice and hot. And I said, okay, just ignore Titus. Ignore Titus, I am. No, not the hair. <laughs> Go get down. So he got a good chug -a lug there, but it was still only about five ounces. Look at your bellies, kinda. Here, you want more? So Farrell chugged about six ounces of milk this morning, which is much more than he took for me a couple hours ago. So I'll take it. And as I was editing the first part of this video, I wondered if maybe my estimations were wrong about the size of the barn. So I did pull out the tape measure and measure everything up and it's actually 16 feet wide by 21 feet long. So with a little bit of math, that means in this big space here, we could fit 21 standard size goats. And I have quite a few Nigerians who need about 10 square feet per Nigerian. So with them considered, it's probably still around 30 goats that I can fit in, in here with the standard size and the uh, the Nigerian dwarf mixed up. And then I'll have mini La Manchas, which let's split the difference. Let's say they need 12 square feet. So that is still a really good number, especially because that doesn't count the kidding area either. And that is open most of the year. So even though it does seem to fit my needs, this space, I do still have a plan to expand the barn a little bit. This particular wall right here is, it's in need of a little bit of assistance. It's quite holy, it does the job, but the boards are going to be needing to be replaced in not very long. And I thought about creating more roof as well and extending it out further this way by probably at least 10 feet. So we'll see when we get to that, but that's kind of a long-term plan is to expand the barn this way towards the east. These guys will probably be in here for another few weeks while Feral gets a little bit bigger and then we do have a plan to basically bisect our chicken run and create another buck area over there. Because right now, with Feral included, I have six males on the farm and I'm probably not done. So with the 12 girls in this area, the two boys in the kidding stall, and then there's four boys out in our two buck areas, that equals 18 goats, which is actually, it's less than I thought I had, which made me feel good. I still think there's going to be some spring culls this season. A lot of my girls are bred. I think I have eight bred does right now. So there's a lot of babies getting ready to hit the ground. I plan to retain a lot of them, but not all of them. So more cuts to be made, but for now I'm pretty happy with that number. I think it leaves a lot of room for expansion, especially when you're trying to juggle Ooh, no pepper, not yet, not yet. I'm gonna go get my milk pail. <laughs> Especially when you're trying to juggle a couple different breeds and you wanna keep your own bucks out of those breeds and then enough does for genetic, di genetic diversity, it really can add up. So goat math. All my people who keep goats out there, you know all about goat math. However many goats there are though, I know that they're starting to get hungry. So I've gotta get my milk pail and start the chores. a few times about the reasons that I'm calling certain goats. So one of the calls that we made this last, in the last couple months was Eidolon. 
and Idolin was one of our dairy goats, or one of our Nigerians that has three teats, which is not acceptable with a dairy goat as far as shows and things go. So we got we got rid of Idolin because of the three teat situation, but we did end up keeping her brother and her mom, and that's raised quite a few questions, understandably. So absolutely on the top of the list of one of the reasons that I didn't get rid of Pepper at the same time that I got rid of Idolin is I'm trying really hard not to count my chickens before they hatch. I do have my La Mancha does all bred, but I've done that in years past and we have had some things happen that basically made it to where we didn't get out of our girls what we wanted either in milk production or in kids. So our bug havoc is really good at throwing girls but I don't necessarily want to count on that I'm going to get does out of all of these La Manchas. I'm hoping to get does out of these La Manchas, but the reality is they all could have single bucklings in, in there. And I don't really want to count my chickens before they hatch, as they say. And there are certain goats that are of a good age, that have good production for me. And I want to basically ensure that I have as much milk as I'm gonna want or need until I know that I have replacements for certain goats. So we try really hard here to get milk from our goats year round. And in order to do that, we have to kind of have two different waves of kittings or two different waves of freshenings. Every year, we like to have our typical spring kitting with lots of spring milk. And then I really like to breed over the spring and summer, my Nigerians in order to get winter milk. So I do have two unregistered goats who are very high producers that can be bred over the spring and summer, which isn't usually the case with high capacity milkers. My La Manchas, those goats are seasonal breeders. They cannot, or they don't go into a heat usually outside of about September through December, January. Kind of depends on the goat. And so with that, you really only get spring or early summer kids. And so you only get really spring or early summer milk. It's true that I could milk them through the winter. You can milk a goat for a really long time. Their milk production does go down after a certain a certain time and it really just kind of depends on the goat for that. Some goats are really great at extended lactations but most of them really start to wane and you really want to be able to freshen that supply every year. But you can't milk a goat or you really shouldn't milk a goat in their last two months of pregnancy. They need that energy to go towards building their kids and they really need to change the milk in their udder to the colostrum because the colostrum is really valuable for the baby. So unless you have an overlap of goats in milk where they haven't all kitted at the same time, oftentimes a lot of dairy producers do have a break in milk over winter and we try to prevent that with our Nigerians. I mentioned before that I do have a couple lines of dairy goats who are high capacity that can have babies year round naturally without me having to do any kind of chemical interventions to get them to come into a heat out of season. Those goats, Shveni and Margie, they're some of my favorites. I'm keeping them for sure. But this year, they're due in March, both of them. And if I wanted to get fall milk out of either one of them, I'd have to breed them back pretty quickly, which I'm not super comfortable with. Um, I know that sometimes that happens on accident. Sometimes a doe gets bred back pretty quickly after having babies, but I'm gonna try to avoid that. So at least for this fall, I need to keep on more Nigerians than I will ultimately end up keeping, just so I can ensure that I do get a fresh supply of winter milk for this this year because I'm gonna have to hold over Margie and Schwenly from being bred again until next spring and summer. So they're gonna go an entire year from kidding this year until they are bred back again so I can get them on a fall and winter cycle. So the three girls that I'm milking today, this is Pesky. I just milked Pepper and Mayhem. Those are the only Nigerians that I have kept back so far that are already on a fall cycle. And right now, I mean, it's been a while since Pepper had babies. Right now, I'm not getting out of these three as much milk as I really need to get in order to be 
comfortable with the amount of dairy that we're bringing in. We like to get about a half gallon a day and when they are newly fresh, that's really easy to do with three Nigerians. But it's been since September that Pepper kitted and since November that Pesky and Mayhem kitted. And so they are starting to wane a little bit in their production. We are coming into more milk though really soon. So it's not a huge deal. So even though I have a whole bunch of goats, it doesn't necessarily mean that I'm going to have a whole bunch of winter milk this year. And so I'm trying to be smart and not get rid of too many all at one time. But if you are curious about who is on the chopping block, or at least first up on the chopping block, once I know I can retain as much as I want to, Barely is on the chopping block. She's had a hard time kidding for me the last two and the first two kiddings that she's ever had with me she's had babies that get stuck i think there's some malformation of her uterus there and plus she does have a very hard to milk udder her teats are really really tiny there's really nothing about her that i personally want to continue on here in my herd but also i am very leery of passing her on to anyone else who doesn't fully understand and accept that they might have to help her give birth every year. I'm sort of waiting until she gives birth this year before I declare that maybe she just needs to be called to the freezer because I don't want her to be a problem. I know that I can help her here and if I can sell her to somebody that's willing to accept that she needs a little bit of help, then that's one thing, but she may not be really worth keeping for anyone just because of her kidding difficulties. And that's a super hard decision, but it's a great decision to make for the health of the breed. So, and also the next doe who I'm considering getting rid of, but not until possibly springtime next year is Pepper. Uh, we need to kind of see and experience what Odie, her son, can pass on as far as udders or at least teeth. So Pepper has a little bit of a spur teat. We talked about that a couple videos ago. And I did keep a buck out of her. I really love everything about Pepper's udder, except for the teat thing. And with our registered mini La Manchas, I really don't want that popping up at any point in my mini La Manchas. I really want those guys to be as perfect as I can get um, for the breed standard. So Odie's first kids are due in March and I'll be looking at every single one of those kids very closely. And if he does happen to throw multiple teats, Odie's going to be leaving the farm as well as his daughters. And then at that point, I know that I can't really keep two teeters out of Pepper anyway. And so those guys will be eliminated from the herd, but I'll still be keeping Pepper on for my winter milk because I'm gonna need her, at least for this year. Going. There's absolutely too a saleability factor in keeping back some of the Nigerians. The Nigerians are really good at throwing multiples. They're tiny. A lot of people like to buy them for house goats or really small lots of land where they want dairy goats. And I think if I were to get rid of every single Nigerian, uh, fall milk aside, that we would not sell nearly as many goats every year. And the sale of dairy goats is really how we're able to have a herd of this size. So we just sold Rory. Wonderful, wonderful family. Her new owners are amazing. So Rory normally has triplets. And let's say her new owners sold each, each kid for $250, which is on the low end for sure. That's absolutely super conservative. Rory's kids can sell for $400, depending on, on what they are and how they look. So on the low end, Rory every year is worth $750 to the farm that she's on. And here we need 200 bales of hay. The bales of hay are $5 each, so that adds up to $1,000. Rory by herself very nearly pays for all of the hay, for all of the animals, for the entire winter, which is super valuable. So considering things like that, also has me keeping a few more Nigerians than normal because it allows me to do the rest of the things. It allows me to do all of what I want to do with the other breeds that I really want to focus on. Can we talk about Tali? Can we talk about Tali? <laughs> Talia, come here. Come here. 
things. <laughs> So even though we love our La Manchas here, and I know a lot of you love the La Manchas, a lot of you follow me because we have La Manchas and not a lot of people do, La Manchas are a really hard sell. There's something about the lack of ears that freaks people out. It's a lot like the, the red eyes on the rabbits. A lot of people don't like the red eyes on rabbits because it freaks them out. A lot of people prefer ears on their goats. So there is a saleability factor that plays in just because of the lack of ears. I love it, but not everyone does. <laughs> Why don't you go eat hay? You, feel, you need to eat hay, go eat hay. Are you eating hay down there? Do you want another bottle? I bet you do. Okay, I'll be right back. You want some more? Now you're ready, okay, okay. There we go. This is milk from his farm. <laughs> yeah. Well, gracious. There, that was 10 ounces. There we go. Oh my goodness. <laughs> that was milk from his farm. So he knows his mama's in that bottle, don't you? You know. So cute. <laughs> oh, it's so cute. Oh, dun, dun. I just, oh, guys. I don't know why people don't like the La Manchas. Look. Just look at them. Oh, okay. You ready for a little bit more? You want to finish it up? Yeah, now he wants it. There. 12 ounces down the hatch. That's what we wanted. That's what we wanted. Good boy. So we're really excited to use Feral in our mini La Mancha program. I may have counted my chickens before they hatch as far as buying him goes, but also I am able to use him and breed him back to my standard La Manchas and still get F1 La Manchas out of it. So it's not a total loss if my girls happen to have all boys, but we're going to hope that that does not happen. <laughs> He's ready to go. I don't think he loves me half as much as I love him. <laughs>